start? You can hear me? Yes. Okay. Good Hi. afternoon. So welcome to this uh, afternoon session, uh, which is on the subject of uh, scientific infrastructures for peace, uh, from CERN to the Cezanne Synchrotron Light in Jordan to the new CIS initiative in Southeast Europe. All the presentations today are follow the general theme of science diplomacy, but in this case is more applied science diplomacy. So the goal is to see what are the challenges and the lessons learned in creating new research infrastructures in critical areas, with the goal of promoting peaceful cooperation and build the trust. We will follow in this session a kind of a fil rouge connecting three different infrastructures. The first of all is CERN, that uh, as our director general said during the introductory uh, <coughs> session of, uh, of Azov, was created after a crisis. And this was a big crisis, uh, was World War II, where user, Europe was completely different from what is now. And uh, the experience of uh, creating CERN in this critical environment then uh, was transferred to Sesame in Jordan, uh, which is now in operation, it's been built in, and is in operation. And now the next step uh, would be to follow this experience uh, to in Southeast Europe uh, with a new CEAST initiative. For this, uh, um, to follow this line connecting these three research infrastructures, uh, we have uh, three exceptional keynote speakers. Uh, the first is going to be Professor Herbig Schopper, who is a prominent experimental physicist, uh, who has been Director General of CERN uh, from 1981 to 1988. Those were exceptional times. And uh, Professor Schopper is one of the fathers of the LEP particle collider, which was the machine that brought CERN into a new scale, new dimension for particle <coughs> physics. And also he was one of the originators of both the SESAMI facility and now of the CEAST initiative. The second speaker is going to be Professor Rolf Dieter Hoyer, who is another prominent experimental physicist was also been director general of CERN, but later from 2009 to 2015. And uh, he was a person who, uh, during his directorate, uh, the HC accelerator started operation, uh, routine operation, and uh, was during his directorate that was announced the discovery of the Higgs boson. Professor Hoyer now is here because he is a president of the Sesame Council and we report on the Sesame experience. <clears throat> Our third speaker, is Minister Sanya Damianovic, who is Minister of Science of Montenegro. So after, also after a career as a particle physicist in Germany and at CERN, she was called back to her home country in 2016 to take the role of Minister of Science. And from there, he, she had a great experience in promoting science in the heart of the Balkans, but also in starting a new initiative that should federate the Balkans the, 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 the states of the region into the new seas. So now we can start from Professor Schopper, who is going to give us the perspective of uh, CERN and uh, what was the what what were the conditions <laughs> of Europe at the moment when CERN started, and then how this experience, uh, how started the idea of transferring this experience into this new facility. So Professor Schopper, please. Thank you, Mauricio. Well, first of all, cool. ladies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Of course, I, I regret very much that this afternoon I cannot be with you at Trieste, this beautiful town, which I've visited so many times because up to Salam started there the ICTP, which has become one of the uh, great symbols for international collaboration. But today I'm supposed to talk about CERN, which is a unique facility. In order to understand why it's unique, one has to go back right to its foundation. After the war, after the last world war, Europe was in ruins, nothing worked, industry did not work, politics did work, nothing worked. And to uh, characterize you how bad the situation was at that time, 
I didn't renew my driver's license because I thought I would never have a car again in my life. Nevertheless, in spite of this terrible situation, some people had visions and in fact, there were two initiatives. One initiative came from the European physicists who realized that in order to be competitive or to become competitive with the United States, they said one has to put together all the European forces. The second initiative, which I think to my regret is largely forgotten, came from the political side. There was a Swiss politician, uh, 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 Denis de Rougemont, who invited European politicians to a conference in Lausanne in 1949, where they discussed what could be done to bring together the countries which had been at war in, in previous years. And they said, well, scientists are relatively, relatively reasonable people, so why not use this science as a tool? And so out of these two initiatives by physicists and politicians, the two initiatives came together at a conference of UNESCO in Florence, Firenze, and there Isidore Rabi, who was an, an European emigre to the United States, played a major role. He suggested that one should uh, create a European laboratory under the umbrella of UNESCO. And that's how it, uh, uh, CERN started. Now, I had invited Rabi to the 30th anniversary of CERN, and in his speech, he said the following, I quote him, I hope that the scientists of CERN will remember that they have other duties than exploring further into particle physics. They are guardians of this flame of European unity so that Europe can help preserve, can help at least, to preserve the peace of the world. Well, uh, I think CERN is unique in uh, this respect that it is a laboratory which has these two objectives promote science and technology on one hand, but at the same time, help to bring together countries with frictions, which is called science policy sometimes, nowadays called, uh, was called science of peace, now it's called science policy, and now it's science diplomacy, and so on, never mind. Now, how could CERN achieve that? And let me mention a few principles. The first one, or, or methods, the first one is the governing body of CERN is a council where every country has two delegates, one diplomat and a scientist. And they have to work together in daily business, so that's a very strong link between science and diplomacy. Second principle is that each country has one vote, independent of its size, independent of how, how much it contributes uh, to, uh, financially, and in particular, there's no quota be it for the employment of staff, be it for the approval of experiments and so on. It's only excellence and competence which count. And finally, over the long years and several decades of the existence of CERN, a new style of European collaboration, which now has become a worldwide collaboration, has been uh, uh, established. I cannot go into details now, but it's remarkable because the so-called experiments are really big projects by themselves, each costing more than 1 billion euro, whatever currency you want. But they are rather independent of CERN because their finance is independent, their management is independent of CERN, and they are managed very democratically. And I think this becomes a new possibility of global collaboration. CERN was founded in, in 54, formally, as I said, it has now a staff of about 2,400 people. In fact, the staff went down over the last 30 years from 3,500 to 2,400, which is quite remarkable because at the same time, the number of outside users, and CERN is mainly is a facility to be used for outside people, uh, the number of users has gone up by many factors from a few thousand in the beginning to more than 13,000 now. And another remarkable thing is all the attempts and all the new projects which are built at CERN were done within a constant budget, which was corrected for inflation, of course, but no increase of the, of the budget. Now, uh, there, 
the users uh, come from all over the world. You see here on the uh, screen, in blue are the member states of CERN, European states. In green are so-called observers, like Japan, Russia, and US, but they are really more than observers. They are really very active participants. And in red, there are countries with which uh, uh, CERN has special contracts. So about more than 7,000 users from the member states, more than 3,000 from the so-called observers, and then the rest, another 2,000 from all over the world. Now, uh, so, oh, I forgot to mention CERN at the beginning, of course, had 12 member states. Now there are 25, and uh, new member states coming in every year now, practically. The main instrument of CERN, main tool is a large hadron collider, which uh, was built in the tunnel, which was built for, for a previous project. So it was a nice way of recycling the tunnel. The tunnel 27 kilometers circumference. You see on the screen in the back the, uh, the uh, Mont Blanc mountains here, beautiful Alps. And uh, you see also indicated here the frontier between France and, and uh, Switzerland. And the tunnel is crossing the borders several times. Another but a, a remarkable effect for, for a facility. Now, of course, I cannot, unfortunately, I cannot talk about the physics of, of CERN now, but let me just mention what we do in this collider, protons are colliding and producing in the collisions states of matter at very, very high temperatures. These are temperatures which existed immediately nanoseconds or the microseconds after the Big Bang. So we are investigating better as it existed after the Big Bang. In that sense, particle physics has become a part of cosmology, and I think that is really fascinating, but I cannot go into it now. Uh, well, in that way, CERN has become a leader in particle physics, and you probably have heard of the discovery of the six Higgs particle. I don't have, I have time to go into it. But I want to mention that CERN has many other also unique programs. Let me mention only one, which is the production of antimatter. CERN is probably the only place in the world, in, in, in the, the Earth, and probably in the universe, where antimatter can be produced in sufficient quantity that the behavior of antimatter can be studied by itself and compared to the behavior of matter. And there are many other interesting programs. Another first uh, unique thing of CERN was that it uh, developed uh, now 30 years ago already a very large and fast global net data network which was necessary to transmit the data from the CERN to the many universities all over the world who participated in the experiments. It fulfilled the task of reversal of brain drain for Europe. Here on the right, you see a, a, a graph that shows in red the number of Americans working at CERN, and in blue, the number of Europeans working in the United States. And you see there was a crossover they are working more Americans now at CERN than Europeans in the United States. The other topic which would need a, a talk by itself is the knowledge transfer, know-how transfer to industry, which is uh, very successful at CERN. And another topic is a training of students. There are among these many thousand users, there are many uh, students, of course, uh, certainly, not all these students will remain in particle physics, but it turns out that the methods they learn in particle physics are such that are uh, useful in many other professions, in banks and what have you. And I think one can say there's practically no unemployment for people who are trained in particle physics. And finally, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a cont contribution to science for peace. Let me say a few words about that here. Of course, uh, the collaboration CERN cannot help to solve the real problems, the, the political problems in the world now. But I think the main point is the collaboration can help to create long-term confidence, which eventually 
radiates from science into politics. Let me mention only one example. CERN signed, it was the first Western uh, uh, organization which signed at that time a contract with the Soviet Union, a collaboration contract with the Soviet Union to have a collaboration with the Soviet uh, Institute at Tsarpukov, another one with, with this, the Dunga International Institute. And these contracts became models for similar contracts later with the United States, and they were used later to state contracts between these countries. So building up confidence, I think, is one of the major elements which we can produce. But sometimes uh, immediate consequences, CERN sometimes uh, use, were used as a neutral platform for political discussions. This was, was for instance, the case when Reagan and Gorbachev, in the preparation for the Reagan and Gorbachev uh, meetings, 1985 in, in Geneva. Uh, CERN was a place where sometimes uh, scientists from completely different countries or countries and big fictions work together. For instance, it was the first time that uh, scientists from the People's Republic of China and Taiwan worked together in the same experiment at CERN, which could be done only by the immediate direct approval by Deng Xiaoping at that time. And finally, I could give you many uh, examples how CERN helped to dissident individuals in countries in, uh, where they had difficulties and to give them some help. Now, because of this, CERN finds now more interest in politics and even economy. For instance, CERN has many meetings now, some meetings with UN office in Geneva. CERN Director General is an advisor in the different uh, committees at UN in, in, uh, in New York. It's advisor in the different uh, European, uh, 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 European Union committees. CERN is invited now more or less regularly to the uh, World Economic Forum at Davos every year and there are many other links. Now, because of this success, CERN has become the cradle for other international projects in other fields. For instance, very soon after the uh, foundation of CERN, CERN became this cradle for the European Southern Astronomy and later also for EABL, the European Molecular Biology uh, Laboratory, both were, had their original seat, temporary seat at CERN because they had became their own organizations. And as was mentioned by Mauricio Retina already, Sesame, uh, the uh, secret laboratory in Jordan is also a child of CERN. And you will hear more about it also about CES uh, from, uh, from, from uh, uh, Royal Fire, we'll talk about Sesame later and uh, Sanja Damjanovic will talk about CES. I agreed with Roy Foyer that I will add a few remarks about the foundation of Sesame because that was really so closely, so intimate to CERN that uh, it's part of CERN. Sesame is a radiation, sync control radiation laboratory, so a strong, very strong light source for all kinds of wavelengths and very useful both for physics, biology, environment, archaeology, what have you. Forget what SESAMI stands for, the acronym was uh, invented later, but who knows still what CERN stands for? Nobody, has, nobody knows, but it's, CERN has become an acronym, a quality seal by itself, so SESAMI also. So uh, let me only point out that SESAMI is a firm, was a, the first international organization in the whole Meda region. So how was it founded? There was a theorist, an Italian theorist at CERN, Fubini, Sergio Fubini, who had in 1997 the idea to start workshops to bring together Israel with Arab countries. And during these discussions, the idea came up to start also a laboratory, an international laboratory, and help to establish peace in the Middle East. At a certain moment, Kubini asked me to come in and uh, help. 
And I thought the only way to establish a laboratory in this difficult, politically so difficult uh, uh, region there was to repeat the foundation of CERN under the umbrella of UNESCO. So I wrote to uh, Frederick Mayor, who was at that time the Director General of UNESCO. He invited all the countries of the Mediterranean region and MENA region, and they came, about 12 countries and six observers came to a meeting in Paris in uh, 1999, and they agreed to set up a, a preliminary council for, for, for again, follow the example of CERN to start this uh, organization. Now, this had, it has to, one has to go to the various tedious and long procedure at UNESCO to get it author, authorized. Such an authorization for a new international organization usually takes four to five years, but we could shorten that fortunately a little bit. And in the end, I mean, there are almost 200 countries in, represented in UNESCO, which had to agree to it. And there was a, a unanimous decision in the end. And in, the, in their decision, they, it is said, CESAME is an essential UNESCO project, combining capacity building with vital peace building through science. And they added, it is a model project for other regions. Now, a few words about finding a site. Finding the site for the international organization is always very difficult, and I could tell you many stories about the CERN site. Now, the problem was that for CESAME, there were 12 sites were proposed by seven different countries. Again, following the example of CERN, the condition for the host state was that all scientists from the world should get access to the site and the site should get diplomatic immunity, the site itself for import, export, but also the personnel. And the other one was, this, of course, the site should be offered free and some building should be provided by the old states. Now, the first condition that all scientists should have access to the world excluded some countries from the site. Some countries said, no, look, that we cannot uh, provide. So we had long, difficult discussions, negotiations. I cannot get into it. I will only tell you how the site was chosen. If you look at the official papers, you will find mentioning many meetings we had at CERN and discussions. But reality is usually different than what you find in official papers. The reality was that by the help of a future student from Jordan I had, it was possible to get an, uh, an audience with the King Abdullah II of Jordan, which uh, together with an uh, uh, assistant director general of UNESCO, Yakarino, I visited. And of course, I had to present to the king, king the conditions. And fortunately, of course, he had been briefed beforehand, so I knew, knew the conditions beforehand. So to my surprise, he immediately said, Yes, I am prepared to accept these conditions. I asked him, can we get that in writing? He said, yes. Half an hour later, I had a letter by him where he agreed that, he would, that Jordan would fulfill all these conditions. And Jordan kept it, so Sesame uh, came about. But that is a different story than what you find in the official papers. Now, after that, he started in, uh, in 2003, there was an inauguration of uh, the groundbreaking. It was on the right, you see the king again. On the left is, was the then director general of UNESCO, Matsura. And a few years later, in 2008, the first version of the building was, uh, was finished. And I will follow, uh, uh, I will stop here. And you will hear more about this from Royal Foyer. Well, what's my final message? My final message. It would be the following. Again, remind you what terrible situation Europe was in after the war. Nevertheless, CERN was born. And I forgot when I talked about uh, the LHC, I forgot to mention, let me do it, say it now, looking at the future. 
LNG will be in the coming 10 to 20 years, will be the most important uh, dominating accelerator for particle physics in the world. It has a new upgrade program, which will provide higher intensities and somewhat higher energies for the next 10 to 20 years, the future of CERN and of LHC together with all the other programs is guaranteed. We'll, and we, are, we expect very important discoveries there. But CERN, of course, has long-term futures, uh, long-term problems also. You might have heard about the long thunder, 100 kilometers long. Okay, these are dreams at the moment, but let's see. And then, as I said, the other uh, 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 laboratories, CESAB is existing now, and I hope that CES also will become a big success. So, when it was possible that some of these dreams became reality in the, in, the, in the past, let me hope that these dreams will not be what's now sometimes called fake facts, but let me hope these dreams will become real reality, real facts also in the future. So let's hope for the best. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. So we have uh, uh, decided that we are going to take questions at the end. So if you have questions, you are invited to ask them in the chat, and then we will uh, process all the questions at the end. And now we go to the next speaker, who is Professor Hoyer, who will tell us something more of the Sesame experience, of the challenges of Sesame, and also what is needed to make Sesame sustainable is another issue for this type of uh, endeavors. So, Professor Hoyer, please. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody, to this interesting session. And I'm now following on on uh, Havik Shopper's presentation, and I concentrate on Sesame, which is another unique facility. But I call it here from dream to reality, because it's something which we have now really achieved. So how can I forward now? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm sharing the screen, but it doesn't doesn't move. No, unfortunately, it doesn't move. Yes. Is it working now? Do you see? Yeah. Okay. Let me start from CERN to Sesame, and you heard from Havik Schopper that CERN was conceived in the late 40s with two aims, namely to enable the construction of a facility for, at that time, nuclear and today particle physics research beyond the means of individual members. And the second aim was to foster 
the cooperation between peoples recently in conflict. Now, Sesame has the same aims with slight difference. First of all, it's younger, conceived in the late 90s, but the aims are very similar. Enable the construction of a facility, but this time for a broad range of scientific research. Again, beyond the means of individual members and also to foster cooperation. The question is how to achieve the broad range of scientific research? Well, the answer is synchrotron light sources. Synchrotron radiation is produced, you see it on the left-hand side, uh, when electrons are accelerated in a circular collider, they radiate photons, and these photons are the synchrotron radiation. And it has a spec different spectra, different intensity, di different energy, and you can use it for many, many different research fields, from medicine, energy science, environmental material science, physics, chemistry, arts, and cultural heritage, archaeology. So it's a very broad range of research fields, a very broad range of science. So broad programs make synchrotron light sources the ideal facilities for building scientific capacity. And in addition, international collaboration is the obvious way for countries with relatively small scientific communities. You want to build scientific capacity, so you start with small scientific communities and or limited science budgets in order to build such a light source. So. Synchrotron light sources then, when they are built, are used as facilities. Scientists are typically going there for two or three times a year for several days or weeks to carry out their experiments. And this allows them then to enter collaboration with scientists from other institutions, from other countries. And in this way, again, you are building uh, capacity, but also building bridges between different people and different uh, societies. Now, SESAMI stands for Synchrotron Light for Experimental Science and Applications in the Middle East. But there are some 60 light sources in the world, so you might ask, why do, you, do I need more? Well, they are heavily oversubscribed. There's a large demand for in all these different research fields, and you would like to have a synchrotron light a light source in your vicinity. You want to go there not without having to travel too far. And Sesame is now the first synchrotron light source in the Middle East and is still the only one in the Middle East. It's located in Alan in Jordan. You heard the stories about the, uh, the site selection. And it will promote scientific excellence, but also technical excellence, not only in the Middle East, but also beyond. And the big hope is that it will in particular achieve the return of scientists and the return of engineers from the, the re, back into the region. And in this way, build very quickly more scientific capacity. It will also build scientific and cultural bridges between different societies in the Middle East and again beyond. And here are the Sesame members. Compared to the many CERN members, it's a small group of members. It's eight members. But it's international cooperation as an example of peaceful cooperation. Because if you look, who are the members? From the right to the left, Pakistan, Iran, Jordan, Turkey, Palestine, Cyprus, Israel, and Egypt. It's a fantastic mix of members. It's a fantastic mix which works. And therefore, as I already said, it's a prime example of peaceful cooperation. Sesame is owned by its members, so to speak. They have the full control over its development, over its ex exploitation, and the financial matters. And the governing body of Sesame is the council with very similar uh, rules uh, and regulations as a CERN council, two members per two, two delegates per member, and one vote per member. But only the members would not be able to build such a facility and to operate such a facility. 
So Sesame has many, many partners, and the main ones are the so-called observers. And you see in, in the top three lines, the observers of Sesame, who, which range all over the globe from Brazil, Canada, China, to France, Germany, Greece, Italy, Japan, Kuwait, in the UK and the US, and also CERN and the EU. And these observers provide A, sizable, and B, very tangible support for all areas of Sesame's activities. And I can say without the observers and without the members, of course, Sesame would not have been possible to be realized. That's a clear statement. But Sesame has also long-standing ties with other institutions, UNESCO, IAEA, ICTP, the International Union for Pure and Applied Physics, professional societies, private foundations. Sesame has established very many, many close links with a large number of forefront light sources and also research laboratories in the world. And again, these are vital for the success of Sesame. As an indication how well the standing of Sesame is, meanwhile, within the world, Sesame is the first associate of LEAPS, which is the League of European Accelerator-Based Photon Sources, that where, where all the accelerator-based photon sources in Europe are together and developing their, their common vision. All these partners promote Sesame and provide support for many areas of Sesame's activities. Again, members, observers, and the partners together. That's the key in order to have success. Because you, you immediately also implement or pro provide all the experience from all these different institutions. And this photo you saw already, I turned it a little bit around from the groundbreaking on the left-hand side to the completion of the building five years later in 2008. And Havik Schopper said, the first building. Why did he say the first building? Because if you now go to Alan and look at the building, you see that the roof is no longer green, the roof is white. Because there was a heavy snowfall, uh, also in Jordan it sometimes snows, and there was a heavy snowfall and unfortunately, the roof collapsed uh, a few years a few years after the building was was uh, established was built, and uh, the roof was uh, refurbished was done a bit more strongly because maybe some more snowfalls might come. One never knows now nowadays, but then the color of the roof has or changed as it's now white. And this is what you want to build into this uh, building. So 2008, the building was there. But then it had to be filled with instrument, with uh, with elements, uh, with a main storage ring here. The large circle is the main storage ring, and but you have to produce the electrons, you have to collect the electrons, shape the electrons, fill them into the storage ring, and then they run around and they produce the photons. And then you have many many so-called beam lines, the experimental stations with which you can carry out experiments. Okay, so. 2008, that was not yet there. But then there were some funding problems, but finally one found all the funding necessary, all the resources necessary. And the first 16 sectors of this main storage ring, 133 meters in diameter, uh, in, uh, in circumference, arrived at CERN in March 2015. And it's again, an excellent example of international collaboration. Look on this photo, who produced the pieces. Coils came from the UK, France, the sex to pole coils, Spain, quattro poles, Pakistan, cypoles, Germany, the vacuum chambers, Turkey, quattro pole coils. In addition, Italy, power supplies, Switzerland, controllers, correctors, and Israel power supplies. And uh, also it was a very, very nice collaboration between CERN as a coordinating body, Sesame members and Sesame observers. And the funding came to some extent by the EU. 
The installation of these accelerator components were completed, was completed then in November 2016. So it took quite some time between uh, the inauguration of the building and the completion of the accelerator components. But half a year later, Sesame was inaugurated on the 16th of May by King Abdullah II of Jordan. And you see here on the right top where he unveils the, the plaque uh, was, uh, for, of this event. And on the, at, at the bottom, you see some of the proud people <clears throat> who were present at the event. And there's a very nice by chance coincidence that the 16th of May has been declared as the day, International Day of Light. I think this is a very nice coincidence between this declaration and this inauguration of Sesame. <clears throat> but only with a ring, with an accelerator, you cannot do experiments. You need the experimental stations. And <clears throat> two years later, July 2018, two of the experimental stations, the, the X-ray absorption uh, one and the infrared beam line were operational. So in July 2018, just a year later, science could start. And this is why I say Sesame, from a dream 1997 to reality in 2018, be because it on the 17th of July 2018, the research program could start. And it was a very nice signal again that the first experiment was dealing with cultural heritage investigation on that. A third station became operational end of 2019, end of last year. That's the material science beam line. Of course, no experiments have been performed at that yet because of the corona crisis. But there are many users. So the number of registered users is already nearing 1,000, close to 1,000 now. And I have here some statements from Turkish, Egyptian, and Israeli uh, researchers. Here, the Turkish one, uh, catalytic activity and stabi stability of novel nanomaterials, which is looking at. Uh, Shihan Ahmed looks uh, into uh, Alzheimer's Alzheimer disease. And uh, Brian Rosen looks into the question of uh, materials which uh, where you can uh, convert chemical energy into electrical energy with the aid of electrons made from catalytic materials. So again, a very broad uh, range of uh, research. <clears throat> but Sesame research has only started two years ago, but it is already a success story. Submitted proposals for the first two beam lines were 55 in the first call and 103 in the second call, far beyond the means of, uh, of Sesame, so fully oversubscribed. Proposals approved were 28 and 58, respectively, and up to now, 66 of these experiments have been carried out. More are presently in progress in remotely. And then, since now the, th the third beam line is, uh, is uh, available, the submitted proposals for three beam lines in the third call is 151. Again, very much oversubscribed. So I find this a fantastic success. There's a strong demand by researchers from all the members of Sesame plus beyond. And also the output is already there. Publications in peer reviewed journals are now 10. 10 have appeared. And further, 25 are very well advanced. I have seen statistics how uh, publications from synchrotron radiation uh, appears. And it takes sometimes several years until these publications appear. It's a, it's a tedious job. The fact that 10 have already appeared and so many are well advanced is a fantastic sign of also the ability the excellence of the researchers in the region and their eagerness to perform experiments, to evaluate the experiments and to publish the results. Now, four more stations will follow in the next years and the two green ones on the top will be sponsored by the European Union, BEATS, and by the Helmholtz Association in Germany, HESAP, and the two others in blue are in presently in the design phase. But Sesame is doing more. Sesame is going green. 
SESAMI is the only accelerator laboratory worldwide which is powered solely by solar energy. And you see here the inauguration of the solar plant in February last year. Despite the fact that you don't see any, uh, uh, very little green here, SESAMI is going green. But there are, of course, challenges, and I give only a few examples. The biggest challenge for SESAMI is a st sustainability in funding. This is very difficult to achieve, and it is always um, a struggle to get the funding, but up to now, SESAMI has received the funding, but it needs more funding. If you have more users, if you have more beamlines, you need also more staff, and therefore you need also more funding. And the injector system reads renewable. There are many donations from uh, other uh, accelerators like Bessie in Germany, and this has to be renewed in the very near future. So SESAMI needs in particular sustainability and increase in funding. <clears throat> so SESAMI is reality. It is a scientific facility which delivers results. The request for beam time is, too, is very strong. It says I mean, beam time is heavily oversubscribed, which is a very good signal for the eagerness of the people in the region to do science. Sesame is also recognized, meanwhile, worldwide, which you could see from all these uh, uh, connections which Sesame has established. And Sesame is, at least nearly, carbon neutral today. I think this is a big success and should make the parents who started the initiative and all those who contributed and contribute on its way, it should make them very, very proud. And my last slide is on science diplomacy, finally. International global scientific research provides successful models for peaceful cooperation. And global research projects show what mankind is able to achieve when working together coherently and towards a common goal. And I think you have seen, I hope you have seen now that CERN and SESAME have become key examples for science diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hoyer. Thank you very much. Now we go to the third speaker for this session. Uh, I some eco. Can you yeah, yeah, I'm just on it. So ladies and gentlemen, it's really my great pleasure to participate in this wonderful event. And I want, wish to thank Professor Fantoni and the ESOF team for giving me that chance. I'm really happy to present to you yet another great project, which is meant for Southeast Europe, which is after CERN and SESAMI, third concrete example of science diplomacy, CIS project. I am today addressing you not only as a Minister of Science in Montenegro, but as a chairperson of the CIST Steering Committee. So we started our dream and we wish to come also to become a reality. 
So how everything started? This initiative came from Professor Schoffer at the end of 2016, when he proposed such project at the occasion of the meeting uh, of the World Academy of, of Arts in, and Science in Dubrovnik at the end of 2016. Unfortunately, nobody picked up uh, that idea seriously. At the end of 2016, I became Minister of Science in, of, of Montenegro. When I uh, heard about this initiative, I immediately got infected, and since then we started uh, to work uh, together. It took me only a few months to convince the government of Montenegro to officially support uh, this uh, project. Actually, at the beginning, we were worried how to go uh, forward, and, but we were very surprised how many positive receptions uh, we got from a large number of organizations and institutions. So what is the mission of the SAIS project? Its mission is to promote collaboration between science, technology, industry based on technology transfer from uh, other European laboratories like CEN and the others to provide platform for improved education of young scientists and engineers, but also very important objective is to foster cooperation between the countries in the region where still we have quite a bit of friction. Due to recent histories, um, all our scientific economical activities very much slowed down. As a consequence, our region suffer ever since from a strong, uh, a strong brain drain of young generation. We are permanently using our best people, which is our largest economical loss. However, I would like to remind you that this region in the past, several decades ago, had incredible nice period of technology, technological development, and there are plenty of great examples. I would like to remind you that ex-Yugoslavia was one of the founding members of CERN. For example, at that time, Austria was not a member of CERN. Also, uh, the first research nuclear reactor started to operate in our region in 1959, just two years that such research nuclear reactor started to operate uh, in Germany. We had uh, several international institutes, all of them older even uh, uh, than, than CERN. So in order to recover the, the great tradition which we had in the past, to slow down brain drain or even to revert it, the most effective way, or I could even say much stronger, st stronger the only way is to establish a large scale facility based on the latest uh, technologies. So research infrastructures, and we already heard, have already be, been proven as a powerful social, economical, um, to, uh, actually to have a powerful social, economical impact as a multinational venture, helping solving global challenges as powerful neutral tool with the mission of science diplomacy. After CERN in Geneva and Sesame in the Middle East, CIST is yet another concrete example of science diplomacy. So what is the CIS project? It is facility for tumor therapy and biomedical research with protons and heavy ions, which today presents the most powerful and most successful method to treat a large number of tumor types. In this picture here, you see the first such facility in Europe, it's HIT in Heidelberg, which started to operate in 2009. So you don't see scale from this picture, but you can judge by comparing to the size of the patient in this patient room. So presently in the world, there are only 12 machines of such type and only four in Europe, but our CIST is not going to be just fifth such machine in Europe. Our CIST is going to be unique because 50% of the beam time will be dedicated to cancer research, and we are going to use multi-ion sources beyond presently used protons and only carbons. And there will be a lot of other technical improvements, which I will show you um, in the, some of the, my latest uh, slides. So even though 50% of the beam time will be dedicated to research, we will still be able to treat about 500 patients per year, which is the need of a population with about 20 million inhabitants. And CIS will also offer capacity for about 1,000 uh, researchers, including a major number from Western Europe. Let me show you here with these slides why this method is the most powerful method to treat cancer. So I ask you for attention to the picture on the yellow left. 
So you see here doors deliver along the depth of the tissue. And in this picture, the arrow, red arrow, show you the, the position of the tumor. With the conventional method, which is now mostly used, these are the green and yellow line, you see that the largest dose you actually uh, uh, ded dedicate on the health uh, cells and very little dose uh, on, the, on the really tumor region. But fortunately, the different particles different, uh, react differently with matters, and so you see what happened here with the, with when you use ions and heavier particles. This is the blue and red line. So you don't deliver any dose practically on the health issues, and then you deliver full dose onto the tumor, tumor region. Now, thanks to the existing machines and statistics, it shows that success is a, 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 a great success of this uh, method. The survival probability of the treatment of patients after five years is reaching with carbons uh, probability of 95% compared to only 10, 20% with conventional method. Another point which is important with this uh, treatment of tumors with heavy iron is that this is the only way to treat a special so-called radioresistant tumor, and also it's very important for tumors which are close to the risk organs. Now I would like to ask you for your attention to the picture on your right. So you see here the map of the presently existing particle therapy machines. You see many points, more than four, which I mentioned, because they are mostly much smaller uh, proton machines. But what you can see here, that the region of Southeast Europe, uh, the large part of the, of the Europe with about 40 million inhabitants is just the gray zone. Now you can take any type of research infrastructure based on the newest technology, and then you map the Europe. You will see high intensity points everywhere, but this part of Europe, is always remaining as a gray zone. So a lot of progress has been made since, uh, since uh, both on political and scientific scene. On political scene, I mentioned that uh, only a few months later that uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the uh, bird of this idea, Montenegro officially support the project. But we look what happened only a few months later. Declaration of intent was signed on the same ground uh, by eight uh, ministers of the region. <clears throat> Actually, this event was in October 2017, was a unique event for CERN. You know that many politicians are coming at CERN, but what happened here at the same time, at the same time on the same ground, we had 10 ministers uh, or representatives from the ministries um, uh, on the CERN uh, ground. More recently, Last year, memorandum of cooperation was signed by six prime ministers of the sea region at the occasion of the sixth summit of the Berlin process, which uh, uh, took place in Poznan, uh, Poland. So in this here map, you see the, the region of Southeast Europe. So here are the potential candidate members of the SAIS project, and the, the, the countries which are labeled green are those countries which signed declaration of intent. Croatia and, um, uh, and Greece at that time took an observer uh, status. So, as I mentioned in parallel, a lot of progress was made in political and scientific scene. On scientific scene, we finish our first part. We uh, the concept uh, study for CIST was uh, uh, worked out during 2017. A lot of experts from uh, different European countries were involved to help us with this concept. And we had a great event actually in Trieste in Ju January 2018, when for the first time officially this concept study was uh, presented. The event was so great with more than 100 participants, including representatives from the European Commission, from many other um, uh, organizations. And uh, uh, this concept has been also published as CERN uh, Yellow Report. This event was a great trigger that the uh, European Commission actually uh, uh, strongly recognized the potential importance of our project. And we received from European Commission the first direct financial support one, of 1 million euro to start the next phase of the project, the so-called design study phase. So this financial support it was, is, was very important, but would not be enough if we would not receive open hands from the renowned centers, from CEN and from uh, GSI. 
So CEN decided to host the important working group which will work on design of the, of the new uh, state-of-the-art medical accelerator and of course we will have great benefit from long experience in the design of, uh, uh, of medical accelerator from CEN. On the, on the other hand from GSI we also got support for the work group for the working group which will work on the R&D and scientific aspects. I want to maybe mention here probably uh, you don't know that first 440 patients in Europe were not treated with this most, important, most modern method, were not treated in hospital. They were treated at, on the ground of the research centers, on the ground of uh, GSI. We also receive uh, support from International Atomic Energy Agency, which also play important role for SESAMI project, and we received the first uh, financial support to start uh, the capacity uh, building uh, program. Now, this project is mission not only for the region of Southeast Europe, this project is very important also for the Europe as a whole. So there is a strong pan-European pan dimension of our project. And we knew if we want to be successful, we really need to be competitive. So fight, fighting against, against cancer is one of the largest social ch uh, challenges. And there is real time to develop uh, a more advanced uh, technology to treat the cancer. On the other hand, as also we heard for the Sesame project, we would not be able to build this uh, new beyond state of art medical accelerator if we would not receive a strong international uh, help from many, many European uh, um, institutions and organizations. In, in, in fact, is the presently we have support of 18 European centers and, um, and, and clinics to help us designing uh, this uh, uh, new technology to fight uh, cancer. So um, I already mentioned that uh, the uniqueness of the CIST is due to the fact that 50% of the time is going to be used for, uh, for, uh, for, the, for the cancer, for the research, but there are other unique aspects of this, this machine. Multidisciplinary research with heavy ions, breakthrough in technology and science diplomacy. As to the research part, we are going to offer many different types of research, preclinical, clinical, industrial, material, ultra high dose rate, and all this will be novel because with the help of these uh, European centers, we are making breakthrough in technology. We are now developing much more compact and much cheaper um, accelerator. Instead of use warm magnets, we are trying to push to use superconducting uh, magnets, and also our machine will have high beam intensity, faster, uh, faster extraction, which means that we will be able even to treat uh, many more different types of, uh, of uh, uh, tumor. Science diplomacy, I already mentioned um, uh, that uh, mission of uh, forcing cooperation in the region, but recently we also received political support by the Swiss government to help us to establish science diplomacy uh, roadmap. So um, we are very, very happy that uh, Switzerland uh, stands behind uh, us and to offer us a neutral ground for, for in particular, uh, uh, many dif difficult decisions which we are going to be in front of us. One for sure will be the selection of the site, but uh, it is very nice that uh, soon, um, uh, actually in October, in, October, uh, 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 in Bern, there will be high level seized event which will be patronized and hosted by the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. And this event, uh, will, uh, the, the welcome address uh, will be given by the Federal Council, Mr. Ignacio uh, Kazis. The purpose of this event is uh, presentation of the Swiss plan on the diplomatic facilitation for the establishment of the SAIST uh, project. So we are also happy <laughs> that we are, we are managing uh, to uh, prepare application for the S3 roadmap. Map. This will be very important next step for the SEAS to launch this project on this S3 roadmap. And it is important because in that way, we are going to show the strong pan-European dimension of our project, but also we will also show how this SEAS research infrastructure is strongly aligned with the EU policy, Green Deal, and Horizon Europe mission uh, cancer research. 
So um, the deadline is next week. So please cross fingers for us and please also support us. Now I show you the timeline of our SAIS project. I mentioned our dream started in 2017. We have already finished the first step, concept study. Uh, we start thanks to the help of European Commission and also all these uh, wonderful uh, open hands from research centers. We started a uh, design phase. We are applying for the S3 roadmap in 2021. We have to decide on the, on the site for the project. If everything goes in the way we wish, we could start construction in 2023. And if our dream becomes reality, we would be able to treat in uh, first patient in 2028. For the deceased, 200 million is required. Uh, I would say only 200 million is required to guarantee competi competitivity in Europe. Um, and uh, politically, every, uh, it's accepted that our region needs economical help. So we really rely on multiple sources of financing, like EU structural cohesion funds, IPA funds, uh, some, of course, contribution from the member, member states and other uh, investment funds. On the other hand, we are also going into the direction of the green project. So our project is going to be the first green particle center. And here I show you uh, the 3D model of, uh, of deceased. And let's all hope that our dream uh, becomes a reality. And also we rely on your help. And I would like to wish you to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Danjanovic. Thank you very much. So for your vision, your dream of uh, building a new is a cheaper structure for peace and to treat cancer. So two dreams in one. And uh, I'm going to see if uh, uh, we have... Uh, okay, apparently we have a question from the auditorium. Uh, so I don't know how technically we can get a question from the auditorium, but I hope that our technical support people will help us. Uh. So... Hello. Hello. Uh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, now yes, sorry. Yes. Perfect. Uh, thanks a lot to, uh, to the presentation, to the sweet, sweet speakers. I will quickly take off my mask so maybe it's clear, sorry. <laughs> so I have a question regarding sesame. Uh, so maybe to Mr. Schopper or Mr. Hoyer. I don't know how confident this question is. I want to know whether sesame was consultant in the elaboration of the new peace plan of the Trump administration if somehow they were involved in the elaboration of this plan? And if not, or also if yes, what is, how do you see your role in the entire Middle East peace process, if you see any or on track one or track two diplomacy? <coughs> well, that's Rolf Heuer speaking. Uh, the answer on the first part of the question is no. Definitely not. We were not involved. And uh, let me say like this, if we would have been involved, I hope that the plan would have been different, okay? But that's my personal opinion. Um, for the moment, I think uh, we should concentrate on really the scientific collaboration with research and bridging the, building bridges between the people, but I think we are not yet, it's not, it's not, it's not yet ripe to mingle within politics. And we should, for quite some time, keep politics outside the fence of the laboratory. Okay, thank you. So, there are more questions from the auditorium. No. Maybe a follow-up question. You say you are not yet right, ready to mingle with politics. When do you think comes the moment to be ready? Or what is the right moment to mingle with politics? As for example, CERN that entered as observer state, the UN. CERN entered the observer state at the UN during my mandate. And the Swiss and French governments 
where, where on the side of turn is uh, located. Uh, we're very this. However, you have a different type of uh, yeah, with this politics. We are trying to bring science and the evidence from science closer to politics. We are not advising politics on politicians on politics. We are trying to advise on science. So that's different. And I think the scientists have to stay in their field and politicians in, the, in, in, in their respective field. However, you can talk to each other and you can advise them. Okay? Does this answer your question? Okay. Yes, thanks. <clears throat> but then I would like also to pick up, Bersani, you are both a politician and a scientist. How do you think of the respective roles? Can you enter this? Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Okay, please. Yes, Professor Schoffer, yes, please comment. The relation between science and politics is, of course, very complicated and changes over the time. In, in old times, 20 years ago, it was usual that the big embassies at large capitals had a science attache in the embassy. They have completely disappeared. And uh, there is the official link now between science and direct politics, politics I mean foreign ministries or ambassadors and so on, is missing now. And I was very glad to learn, for instance, that in Switzerland, they have now, when uh, uh, new ambassadors, new diplomats have to go through a training program. And in this training program, there's this particular element where they bring together the future diplomats together with scientists. So, I, as I say, it's very complicated. It's a direct link between the, there's no official method how to, to bring diplomats and scientists together. So, apart from what I just mentioned, I think these uh, institutions like CERN, CESAME, and hopefully CES are places where there are direct meetings between scientists and diplomats. And I think that's very important. And I will say that maybe Sanya can make a comment uh, because you are at the same time yes. a scientist yes. uh, and a uh, politician. Yes, from my angle, I can say I led this project from the beginning, but what really helped me is that I had a dual role. As I had a dual role as a scientist as, and politician. And th that really helped me so much to steer the project. I think this is also what helped me is that uh, I spent large part of my career outside of this region, actually the best place in the world at CERN, and uh, somehow uh, this really helped so much and i really wish that this CIS project then goes into the scheme of our region and that uh, really um, people will will be ready to carry to the end so thank you so interesting discussion so are there more questions online or from the from the auditorium no so maybe I, I have a question, so because I'm always concerned about the sustainability of uh, research infrastructures. What is your plan for sustainability for this infrastructure? Yeah. So this problem of sustainability, of course, it was always an open issue, but our CIS project is special because it has this comprehensive dimension of being a research center and at the same time to treat the patients. So by the fact that we will be able to treat the patient, we will really manage to cover the largest part of the operational costs. And this really helps so much. I can also mention to you that in our region, if you, if you look at the mortality probability for cancer, in our region, this unfortunately statistics is nearly twice or even uh, uh, larger compared to the other, uh, other countries. And this operational cost in our problem will not, in our region, will not be the problem. Why? Because uh, presently, every country in the sea region uh, spent a lot of money to treat our patients outside of the region. So, for example, in Montenegro, we are spending about 3.5 million euros per year to treat our patients outside. So, we as a CIS, we don't have any worry about uh, sustainability part of our project because of this, again, comprehensive and dual uh, dimension. And what about the research part of, uh, of, of this research infrastructure? So it is a research infrastructure, so what is the experimental program, what are the goals? Yes, so for the research part, we will also treat uh, CIS in the same way, way like at CERN. 
So every country will have their own contribution. They will pay some contribution to use the beam lines. But what also is nice is that our project is very attractive for industry, uh, but also is attractive for ESA, European Space Agency, because the heavy ions are larger issues for astronauts, and we now offer also our facility for them. Uh, we don't have, they don't have any worry in this direction, because as I said, for industry will be very attractive, for the ESA will be very attractive, and of course, uh, the, the lowest rate we will uh, offer to uh, our, our researchers from university, and I think we will manage with these sustainability aspects. We study that, we are very con convinced in that, that there will be no problem in that direction. Can I, can I add something here? Uh, Maurizio, I think uh, the sustainability problem becomes uh, less of a problem once uh, you show that you deliver what you promise. That helps a lot, but that takes some time. You have to mature a little bit, but uh, once you have uh, crossed that maturity threshold, I think then uh, things become easier. But at the very beginning, I think you, you struggle, but uh, you have to be uh, pushy and then it will work. I mean, CERN is a very good example, sustainable since 65 years, and uh, I hope that also Sesame will, will be in that direction. Uh, we are doing everything what we can, and we hope for even more members, that, members uh, to join, and that would help a tremendous amount and bring the uh, facility also much, much forward. Thank you very much for uh, your comments. Sir. Okay, do you have more, uh, uh, there are more questions on the orders on, online? I don't think so. Do we have any final conclusion uh, to, uh, to draw from do the speakers? Uh, want to take uh, a few minutes more for any uh, additional comment or final conclusions? No? Okay, so if not, I think that uh, we can stop here. Of course, we thank the organizers for giving us the chance to present uh, our dreams ongoing old, ongoing and future dreams to this community. And of course, we all wish the best success to the ongoing Sesame and to, uh, to the deceased, and why not also to CERN. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks all for your attention.